mommy, can you call me Zoe? She looked at me and she was like, why? And I said, because no one can say Ozamaka. And she just like, without skipping a beat, she was like, if they can learn to say Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky and Michelangelo, then they can learn to say Ozamaka. <laughs> can they really though? Can people actually learn to pronounce a foreign name the way the person themselves pronounces it? In this video, we're gonna find out. This video is all about the phonetic and neurolinguistic factors and challenges of pronouncing someone's name the way they themselves pronounce it, or really about pronouncing any word. Part one was all about the social factors at play, which you can watch right there, or maybe up there, or if I haven't figured out how to put stuff on screen, it'll be linked in the description. So let's get into it. Can people actually learn to pronounce your name the way you do? It depends. In some cases, simply yes, people can and do do it all the time. But I think there are three major factors that might make it more challenging than most people assume. And I think it affects all of us and many people don't even realize it. The first thing is something I think most people are aware of, at least on some level. If you've never done it before, it's not necessarily going to be easy to do it because you are literally producing sounds with the muscles in your mouth. And if you've ever tried to get your muscles to do something they've never done before, you probably realize it takes some training to do, even if it seems easy for other people. If you've never done a hurricane rana off the top rope before, even though there's people of all shapes and sizes doing it with ease, that doesn't make it easy for you. It takes training and practice. For example, it took me about 10 years of on and off practice to reliably pronounce R when speaking Spanish, and I still don't do it as well and fluidly as a native speaker would. However, I am quite confident and able to do it quite regularly. And it wasn't always that way. When I was younger, when I started learning Spanish, I really couldn't do it at all. Even though some of my peers, some of the kids around me who never even spoke Spanish, could just naturally do it without many problems. You literally have to train your muscles. It's as simple as that. And you've been training your muscles to speak in your native accent your entire life. So when you try to pick something up later in life, it's a lot more challenging. If you're finding this discouraging for learning a foreign language, please don't be discouraged. There are many people who pick up all kinds of physical skills later on in life and they excel at them. It just takes persistence. But when it comes to learning how to pronounce things a certain way, of course there are other challenges. Even if it's just learning to pronounce things in a different accent from your own in the same language that might have been your native language. These things apply to every part of your speech that is not native to you, even if it's just a few words or a name. This next part I think is much less well known, but you can still find parallels and comparisons for it in other things of your life. People just don't know how to explain things. When it comes to linguistics and phonetics, people don't actually know how to teach somebody how to pronounce things. Even language teachers, look at how many English as a second language teachers there are and ask how many of them understand phonetics and maybe the international phonetic alphabet. A lot of people can do things but aren't necessarily good at coaching it. That's why a lot of those polyglot content creators you've seen probably don't actually teach anybody how to speak another language. Take my name for example, Carson. How do I actually explain to someone how to pronounce that? Now, I'm a linguist, but if I were to try to explain to someone who doesn't understand linguistics, I might say ka, that seems obvious enough. It's a very common sound. Most people could probably figure it out without much explanation. Ah, uh, again, pretty common sound, easy to understand. Er, now that gets really tricky. All kinds of R-like sounds, which we call rhotics, are actually really hard for people to learn. They're some of the latest sounds acquired by native speakers, and they're also some of the hardest sounds to learn in a second language. In fact, speech impediments around those types of sound have their own name, it's called rhoticism. So how do I actually explain to someone how to pronounce that R sound in English in my name, er? If I said that's an alveolar or a retroflex approximant, most people would probably have no idea what that means. Or maybe it's a bunched R, which again, doesn't really help the average person. I would have to sit down and explain that the middle of my tongue is kind of pushed down, but the sides of my tongue are pushed up on the insides of my teeth, and then the back of the tongue is also bunched up a bit. Most people would never go that far in describing how to pronounce sounds in a single word, even if it's their name. And even people who pronounce the sound all the time, how many other native English speakers are watching this video and actually understand what their tongue is doing when they pronounce an R? Do you know if you have a retroflex or a bunched R? Just repeating the name over and over again doesn't actually help people figure out how to make those sounds. You need to actually explain how to do it, not just do it. 
I think it would be great if actual phonetics was in middle school and high school curriculum. I think it's a subject that should be taught, but in reality, most people all over the world learn next to nothing, if not nothing at all, about actual linguistics in their primary and secondary education. And even in higher education, the only reason I even learned anything about linguistics at all was because I had to fill a core requirement and all the other options were math classes that I didn't want to do. And then I ended up loving linguistics and now that's my profession. But before that, I really knew nothing about linguistics or how to explain phonetics at all. And unless somebody followed a similar path to what I did, where the only options for a certain core requirement were all math classes that they didn't want to do and intro to linguistics, then they wouldn't have been required to take a linguistics class. Most people do not have that as a core requirement. Linguistics is almost always an elective and nothing more, which I think is kind of crazy considering most people are forced to take some kind of literature or language arts class where they're forced to read books and do assignments on them, which makes reading really not fun when they should just be reading the books to enjoy them. But you know, that's neither here nor there. Let's get back to the matter at hand. What is the third reason that makes it really hard to actually learn to pronounce somebody's name the way they do? Now, this is one that I don't think anybody is aware of if you haven't studied a very specific part of linguistics. Really quickly, I want to point out, if you like this video, you're probably interested in linguistics, but most of you aren't subscribed. So please subscribe to see more, and it's the best way to support us to continue making good informative linguistics videos. This problem is called perceptual narrowing. It is so unknown that even when I show people the evidence, they don't believe it. When you are growing up and acquiring your native language, you get better at pronouncing the sounds in your native language, but you also get better at perceiving the sounds in your native language. And as you do this, your perception narrows and you lose the ability to perceive sounds that aren't in your native language. Obviously, this doesn't apply to every single sound ever. If you've never pronounced R before or if you've never heard it, you'll still recognize that it's different than R. Some distinctions are much easier to tell apart than others, but especially for ones that are pretty close together, a lot of people cannot tell the difference if it's not part of their native language or even just their native accent. And this gets proven over and over again. For example, this study, which was actually done by one of my professors, hi Sharon, if you're watching, by the way, if you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, especially child bilingualism, look up Sharon Unsworth on Google Scholar, and there are so many things that she's done that you can read about. In the Netherlands, they have been very good at speaking English. Almost everybody there speaks fluent English because they start learning it at about 11 or 12 years old, and they learn every year through the rest of their education. However, recently, they've started learning it even younger, so that some people are learning it as young as four and five years old, and they wanted to see if that actually made a difference in the children's ability to distinguish non-native sound distinctions. In English, the vowels a and a are two distinct phonemes. For example, the words pet and pat sound obviously different to me. But in Dutch, those sounds aren't really distinguished. They kind of have one of them, but that one sound is kind of more like in the middle of the two of them. So they compared Dutch children who started learning English around 11 and 12 years old with Dutch children who started learning English around four and five years old with Dutch children who were also natively bilingual with English. And what they found was for the vowels a and a, the children who started learning English, whether at four or five years old or at 11 and 12 years old, did not tell the difference, and they were consistently outperformed by the children who were natively bilingual with English, who could accurately tell the difference. This was also true for two other sound pairs, which are in English that don't exist in Dutch. The only one that the Dutch children learning English could actually tell as well as the English native speakers was ba and s, which are two sounds that are very distinct and also exist in Dutch. And other studies looking at the ages in which they notice these effects in infants have shown that as young as six months old, you start losing the ability to distinguish the difference between these kinds of sounds in terms of vowels. Consonants start a little bit later, but just six months old and you start losing the ability to distinguish different sounds that aren't in your native language. Some studies have even shown that children who are natively bilingual with Catalan and Spanish could not perform as well as the monolingual Catalan children in distinguishing two sounds that exist in Catalan and not Spanish. Although other studies have disputed those results and found something else. So there's definitely more research to be done, but this effect is definitely something that starts being seen when you are less than a year old and it applies to certain sounds. So if you're asking somebody to pronounce a name or any word with specific sounds, they might not even be hearing it. They might say, I'm pronouncing it just like you. And you say, no, you're not. You're obviously not. You need to say it like this. Carson, not Carson. 
but they might literally not even know the difference. They cannot even hear it, and you don't even know that they can't hear it is what makes it really difficult. Oh, and I almost forgot one last important thing. Even after explaining that someone might not have certain sounds in their native language and therefore it's hard for them to hear it and pronounce it, some people will still say, I don't understand how someone can have all the same sounds in their native language, in their native accent even, and they still might not pronounce the name the way it's pronounced in the original, which seems weird, right? They have those sounds, so they never lost the ability to hear or produce those sounds because they do it all the time. So why in that case are there still some people who cannot pronounce a name the way the original pronounced it. It's not just about the phonetic inventory, the sounds that you have in your accent, it's how you use them. What order do they come in? What context, what environments are those specific phonemes found in? Two different dialects or languages might have the same phonemes, but they might have slightly different qualities. For example, in English, we usually aspirate word initial voiceless plosives. So k at the beginning of a word has a little extra puff of air to it. Like in my name, Carson, I would pronounce it car. But in Spanish, they don't aspirate a k. They have a k. They can even start words with a k, but they don't aspirate it, so it might sound more like gar. Car, gar. Now, if you're not used to aspiration, you might not be able to hear the difference, but it's there. And in fact, there are studies that show English speakers might misinterpret word initial voiceless plosives that don't have aspiration as being voiced plosives, because in English, we don't aspirate the voiced plosives, only the voiceless ones. So when we don't hear that aspiration along with it, we accidentally think it's supposed to be one of those voiced plosives, and that's the way our brain registers it. So in basic terms, the sounds pa, ta, ka have a puff of air at the beginning of a word, but if we hear them without that puff of air, we might think they're actually ba, da, ga, when in reality, they're still pataka, just without that puff of air. Okay, quick note, I spent about 45 minutes looking for the article with the source of that information. I saw it mentioned by a better linguist than me, but all I can find is this paper on acoustical measurements, and I read it, and it doesn't have anything about the actual perception of those sounds. However, it does mention a sequel experiment, which is titled Experiments in Perception. However, even when I specifically search for that, all I can find is the acoustical measurements one. So I will link the acoustical measurements, but I believe the actual evidence is in the Experiments in Perception one, which for some reason is not online. But we can do a quick experiment here. Let us know how you perceive these words. Bat, pat, bat. Did the last one sound like a B or a P to you? It was my attempt at doing a word initial P without aspiration, which was of course not very natural to me, so I'm not sure how well I did it. But it kind of sounds to me very similar to a B, even though I know that's not what I was trying to pronounce. How is it for you? Let us know. So you have things like that where the phonemes might have slightly different qualities to them, and it also depends on the order that they appear and phonetic constraints for certain sounds. I'm going to use the word stop as an example. It's a very basic word, one syllable, four phonemes, and that's it. Four sounds that exist in both English and Spanish. S, the same in both languages. T, the same in both languages because it's not at the beginning of a word, so we don't have to worry about aspiration. A, that vowel exists the same in both languages. P, that consonant exists the same in both languages. Again, not at the beginning of a word, no aspiration to worry about. But if you ask somebody who only grew up speaking Spanish to say that word, they might say it more like esto because the order of those sounds is very unusual for them. Like we said, Spanish has S and T just like English, and it even has an S followed by a T in words. That's not crazy either, but it doesn't have an S followed by a T at the beginning of a word. Because the phonetic constraints of Spanish prevent it from starting a word with an S followed by a plosive without also having a vowel before that S. So Spanish, Espanol, Spain, España, school, escuela, all those words need that vowel sound to come first, and then they can have the S followed by that plosive. Stop. Ah, the vowel. One of the basic vowels of Spanish. Spanish has way fewer vowels than English does, yet they still might pronounce this as esto instead of stop. Because while writing is based on language and it shouldn't influence the way you pronounce things, the way you pronounce things is what's supposed to influence the way writing was designed. The fact is, in our modern world, most adults learn a second language by reading as well as learning to speak at the same time. And Spanish spelling is very consistent. The letter O almost always represents that same sound, O. 
So even though they have the ah vowel, it should never be represented by a letter O in the orthography that they're used to. So they see a letter O and interpret it the way they would normally interpret the letter O as that sound O instead of ah, which would be written with an A in Spanish. And then that P, even though they have the same P, there's no aspiration to worry about at the end of the word. It even shows up at the ends of words in Spanish but that is very rare for it to happen. It's usually in borrowed words or contractions. It's very uncommon to see a native Spanish word ending with P. So they very rarely pronounce words like that because they barely have any words like that. So where I might say stop and have a very small release of the P at the very end, a Spanish speaker might say esto or esto, where they don't pronounce the P at all, or they close their lips and just don't release the articulation. But of course, all of this depends on the individual's exact native language, dialect, and accent, their exposure to other languages, what kinds of things they practiced before, and maybe just some level of natural talent. But even when you have the exact same phonemes, the exact same sounds that exist in many ways, the same context with the same characteristics, they might still not be exactly the way you would expect to pronounce it in your native accent, and that's why we might modify the pronunciation to fit the way we more naturally speak. So again, this is not to tell people who's right and who's wrong. This is just to show that there are challenges going on that most people are not even aware of is happening. So in some cases, you might asking somebody to be doing something with their muscles they've never done before. You might not actually be good at explaining what they're supposed to do, and they might literally not even hear the difference between what they're saying and what you're saying. This isn't the case for every single name or every single word, but this is the case a lot. And people aren't even aware of these challenges as they're having these conversations and arguments. So those are some of the major things that are happening when people are having trouble pronouncing certain things, whether they're learning a foreign language or just trying to pronounce a single word, including names, even in just a different accent of their same language. I think we can both desire that people pronounce our names the way we do, or at least in some manner that we would appreciate, while also still being accepting and understanding as to why it can be really hard for some people to pronounce certain things. And also recognizing our own shortcomings, while we might not be particularly good at explaining a certain thing, and also be unaware that somebody might not even be hearing the way that we're pronouncing things differently. And if you haven't already, please check out part one, which talks about all the social factors and expectations of pronouncing certain names. If you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. Please like and share, comment and subscribe for more, and we hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.